uh, how many people in here have volunteered at some point throughout the conference? All right, I just want to let you guys know that there are a lot of people who have made their 10-hour commitment, um, who have not yet picked up their T-shirts. And so a lot of you, a lot of volunteers are really, really close. And if you haven't volunteered, just like Greg said, we have a really big need for teardown today and tomorrow. Even if you have to take off, you can do little things. If you see a little cup or a bottle or some piece of trash or chairs that aren't right, you can help clean up and help make teardown a much easier process by doing your little part. And if you can, stick around for as long as you can to help us get everything done so that guys like me who haven't really slept in three, four days can actually take it easy tonight. And just on that note, give a huge round of applause for the volunteers who have been working so, so hard to bring this to you. With literally, without them, a conference like this could not be possible. Um, also, I have a couple of other announcements. Um, one, the Club Mate cases, $60. If uh, You'll hear when it's time to do that. Uh, let's bring out the first three panel panelists for today. Emmanuel. Goldstein. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Mitnick. We'd like to also welcome Bernie S. Oh, he's gone. Okay. Bye, Greg. Thank you. Greg Newby, everybody. All right. Uh, we have a, a couple more people that will be showing up on stage, but uh, this is enough to start off with right now. Uh, this talk is, uh, is called Informants, Villains, or Heroes. Um, and we all, we all have stories in our lives as to how informants have, uh, have played a part one way or another um, none of us are informants, are we? Okay. Not well, I. the thing is, in the hacker world, uh, the odds are, what is it, one in four, one in five? It's a, it's a ridiculous percentage, but the number of people who become informants or who are uh, working for two different sides at the same time, it's extraordinarily high. This has always been the case. From the very beginning, back in the 1960s and 70s with phone freaks, you could bet that one in uh, a handful of people would be ratting their friends out. And the question that I think we need to ask here today is, why do people do this? Why does this happen? What, what gets into someone's head when they'll do something like this? And what would you do in a similar situation? And can you judge somebody that uh, you have not been in their shoes? Uh, very quickly, I'll tell my story, and, and then um, uh, these two will tell theirs. Uh, back when I got into trouble in the, um, the mid-'80s, um, hacking into NASA and the White House and various other things via GTE's Telenet system. Um, the unfortunate um, aftermath of that was that uh, federal agents descended on uh, the radio station that I worked at at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. And um, that caused all, co all kinds of confusion because, uh, well, first of all, I didn't own a computer at the time. Uh, so... Um, I wasn't seen to be a suspect, so I had to actually tell the federal authorities who the suspect was. It wasn't the guy on the computer, it was the guy who was actually using the computer, so, uh, you know, send your subpoenas this way. Um, after that happened, I noticed people started acting kind of strange, because, well, when federal agents are lurking about, uh, people get scared. People have all kinds of um, unpredictable reactions. And the thing I noticed most, well, first of all, a lot of people stopped talking to me, but, and I guess that's something that that happens whenever you're under investigation by some kind of uh, law enforcement agency. People kind of freak out and they say, uh, I don't want to be seen with him because I could be busted for something else or guilt by association and whatnot. Um, so there are those people who stopped talking to me. But then there was one person uh, that I found out later because other people didn't know to keep their mouth shut. I found out that this guy had gone to uh, the university uh, legal people and volunteered information volunteered things that, that he had heard me say that might make me somewhat uh, suspect and maybe I'm up to something more because the federal authorities were very interested in who I was, what I was doing. And at the time, I was, I was, I was floored. How could somebody do this? Why would somebody who's not under investigation themselves voluntarily go to somebody and turn in evidence or what they think is evidence or suspicion or gossip or whatever 
uh, without any reason to. I mean, we were friends. This was somebody I'd talk to, somebody I saw every day. And again, the only reason I found out was because some idiot in the university office told somebody else and it got back to me. And yeah, I was I was pissed off as hell when this happened because th this guy's screwing me over for no reason. I never did anything to him. And it's like a witch hunt now. I mean, I was very open about what I did. I, I even went to the feds and told them so that somebody else wouldn't get in trouble for it. And here are people looking to make it even worse. Uh, it was very, very hard for me to understand this at the time. Afterwards, I tried. I, I, I tried hard to, uh, to put myself in their shoes and understand what they must have been thinking when they did this and how scared somebody can be just at the sight of a cop, at the sight of a federal agent, and who knows what demons they have lurking in their closet. People panic. People panic and do things that we don't understand why they do it, and the authorities count on this. The authorities live for this kind of thing so that they get as much information, they get all of us telling other people about other people. This is how every authoritarian government in history has worked, by getting their citizens to spy on each other and report to the authorities, and then more people do it to them. Um, so without the dialogue, and that's what I hope we accomplish here today, the dialogue where we actually try and understand where we're all coming from, maybe we can prevent this kind of thing from continuing to happen. But right now, and as you'll hear with some of the stories uh, today, this is a part of our community that has always been there. Uh, the amount of people who turn into informants, the amount of people who turn people in, uh, the amount of people that you think you can trust with information that you really can't, um, that is that has always been with us and uh, likely will be for, for quite some time. Well, Kevin, what do you have? Yeah, I, um, I had issues with uh, informants as well. <laughs> Did you? Little then? issues, yeah. Um, first of all, the, the way the federal authorities work is it's a divide and conquer. So what they want to do is if they could find more than one person involved in a case, what they'll, what they'll do is they'll try to turn the other person to what they call a cooperator. So, and the benefit of that, obviously, is the person gets a reduced sentence. Or under the federal sentencing guidelines, they get uh, what they call acceptance of responsibility. So, what, so in essence, what the informant or the snitch is actually getting paid with, you know, not money, but less time in exchange for their testimony, which I have a problem with because if a jury found out that somebody was paid $10,000 to testify or they were paid with one year less in prison, to me it's the same. So they actually get paid for their testimony. In my personal experience, when I first hacked, and this is right out of high school, I was 17 years old, um, I became involved with this group of guys, and they knew much more about uh, the risk to see operating system. In fact, they actually were the administrators of the system for the Los Angeles Unified School District. And at the time, I was into phone freaking. I didn't really care much about hacking. I was more very, had a very passionate feeling towards telephony. And um, I wanted to join this group. So what they did is they had their initiation was like an impossible task. They had a, co a colleague that actually worked for Digital Equipment Corporation on the risk to see development team, and they told me to, for, me, them, for me to be able to join their group, I had to break into risk to see development at DEC. And I said, well, how can I do that? Well, we're going to give you the dial-up number. So they gave me the dial-up number, and at the time, you know, the only thing you could do is either guess passwords or use social engineering at that point. So I actually used social engineering. I was able to get in, and... Uh, then what these guys did is they immediately went down to an office that actually had faster modems, you know, like 1,200 baud, because back then we're at 110, 300 baud. So they run down to their office, 1,200 baud, and they're actually copying the source code to the risk to see operating system. And I was kind of watching them do this. And then I found out later, after they finished this task, they actually called Digital Equipment Corporation and told them, I'm the one that hacked in after they stole all their source code. Fortunately, I was a juvenile at the time, and nothing uh, uh, nothing actually happened to me. I was never approached by the authorities. But later on in life, I, um, I chose bad hacking partners. And uh, there was a guy uh, named Lenny DeSico, and he and I uh, always had contests against each other. So 
I worked at a company, he worked